Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, in for Brianna Venosi. New Jersey reported another 6,000 confirmed COVID cases today and an additional 115 deaths. Hospitalizations have now fallen for the ninth straight day and the statewide transmission rate is dropping too. The state continues to urge residents to get fully vaccinated and boosted, even as the numbers are improving. Meantime, Moderna is the second pharmaceutical company this week to announce it's begun testing a COVID-19 booster that specifically targets Omicron. Pfizer is also testing a new booster on concerns over how the current boosters will hold up as the virus continues to mutate. The pandemic continues to hit New Jersey's hospitality industry hard, especially restaurants, some of which had to close for a time, unfortunately some for good. The ones that hung on, well, they're learning to make big changes like reducing their hours and indoor seating. A small number of restaurant owners are trying out a different strategy. As senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, they're ditching indoor dining for takeout. I love the fact that we can order online and just do curbside. Uh So I do come quite often, actually. Tiffany Lawson parks outside Bagels by Jared in West Orange, where signs on the door warn, do not open this door. Inside, chickens frying, staffs prepping, bagged orders sit waiting for the steady stream of customers who pull up to the curb and await delivery right to their cars. I kind of prefer not to have to go in and deal with the lines and the counters, so I just order everything at home and just come on by. And I get the most amazing food in West Orange. Everyone has different comfort levels, so I think it's great for some businesses to do this in order to stay afloat. Have a good one, enjoy. Thank Thank you. you That was basically how this all started, was realizing just that people were no longer comfortable coming into a store, which was very unfortunate because I built a beautiful store. But owner Jarrett Seltzer can tell you timing is everything. He opened his bagel shop only a few weeks before the March 2020 COVID lockdown. Once COVID hit, we had a Wednesday and no one was showing up, no one. We went from being jam-packed to no one. So I went online at 10 a.m. and I said, we're now curbside. It worked. In fact, it boomed. Bagels by Jared expanded its menu to include homemade entries and sales took off. He added two more deep fryers and doubled his staff. Every order must be placed online. Weekends can see 80 door dashes a day. While pandemic pressures forced so many other New Jersey restaurants to close, Seltzer's thriving. It's absurd to say that We basically started during the beginning of a pandemic and we did so well that we're now taking over this entire building. Bagels by Jarrett's doing so well that they're actually planning an expansion into the next retail space, an extra 2,000 square feet. And yes, they're hiring. The takeout is part of the new innovative movement that they've had to make. Restaurant industry rep Dana Lancelotti says a January survey shows 93% of responding New Jersey restaurants reported declines in demand for indoor dining since Omicron. Half reduced hours, 30% closed more days, 23% reduced seating, just 3% changed to only offering off-premises or takeout dining. Lancelotti says it's a tough transition away from traditional dining. You've got restaurants who never had takeout before and they had to redesign their websites. Um, they had to make them more takeout friendly. A lot of stuff. Dan Campius owns stuffed grass fed burgers, an award winning eatery that did 80% takeout even before the pandemic and found it easy to transition to all takeout whenever the pandemic surged. He says curbside and outdoor streeteries are a growing industry trend. People are um, closing down their big restaurants, they're opening up smaller takeout restaurants. Stuffed is doing well enough, but Campius admits he gets pushback from customers upset over Montclair's mask mandate and demanding to sit inside. We are going to allow dine-ins again, um, 
just because we were just losing too much business and, and I feel like it would be easier on my cashiers to not have to deal with so much attitude um, from people, which is really unfortunate because um, it's not hard to be respectful. Restaurant owners and advocates say between inflation, ongoing staff shortages and pandemic mandates, it's tough. Langosta's in Asbury Park closes several days a week and survives with grant money, but less than half of New Jersey eateries that applied for federal restaurant revitalization fund aid actually got it. And for places like Langosta's, takeout isn't an option. It's been very exhausting, mostly. You know, and we're just trying to hold on. We've really had to scale back and kind of minimize menus, minimize staffing, minimize hours to make it through the winter anyway. We need to figure out a way to help the restaurants because I know a ton of people who are struggling. Restaurateurs hope spring will see Omicron disappear and patrons return to dining, whether takeout, indoor, or al fresco. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. A team at Rutgers University has developed a new rapid screening test for Omicron and other COVID variants of concern. The test, which is up for clinical approval, could guide treatment of coronavirus patients and detect potentially severe cases. I'm joined by Dr. Priya Banada, an assistant professor of research at the Rutgers Medical School, who served as the project leader in the development of the test. Great to have you on the program and talk about this latest achievement at Rutgers University. How long have you been working on the test there and how difficult was the process? So the variant detection test started early last year uh, when uh, uh, the alpha and the beta variant uh, emerged. And uh, so we, we very, very quickly uh, within uh, like, like a crash course, we, we came, out, came out with an assay that could detect and differentiate the alpha and the beta, um, uh, the variants. So with, then uh, we all know the process that, that very quickly in uh, May or June of uh, uh, 2021, that the Delta variant took over. So our interest also went on uh, adding the Delta variant to our assay panel. And uh, then we continued our work. And uh, when Omicron came, we just jumped into action. And uh, it was, uh, it, I think it was Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, we immediately saw when the genome sequencing was uh, released uh, that uh, our assay can detect Omicron as well. And uh, we started quickly working on it. And uh, now we have the assay like in like a couple of months, less than that. It's quite an, an achievement to do that so quickly. How is the test able to detect the, the different variants? And, and why is that important for research to, researchers to know the type of variant someone might be infected with? This is a high throughput test. That means it can detect uh, many samples at the same time and, uh, um, and also can be run in many common uh, RT-PCR instruments uh, with uh, a little uh, extra functionality in it. So what we did was we selected uh, three different regions on the SARS-CoV-2 genome and uh, made sure that these are what from our, our research, we observed that these are more susceptible for mutations in all these variants. So targeting these uh, regions uh, would give us uh, a correct identification for the variants. So we have adopted something called uh, a temperature shift uh, uh, principle where uh, when our, uh, we call it sloppy molecular beacons, uh, they bind to this region, they shift the temperature of when, if there is a mutation. When there is a shift, we can correctly identify which variant it is uh, by giving it like a signature. And your second part of the question, why is it important? Why do we even care about it? As you're seeing that each uh, variant is coming out with its own functionalities, characteristics, right? That some are mostly, most of them are vaccine resistant, kind of like, you know, they are uh, um, uh, showing decreased um, efficacy of the vaccines. And uh, with the Omicron, especially, we are also seeing that some of the monoclonal antibodies are not very effective. And uh, if, if you need to make that treatment decision on what variant a particular patient carries, uh, it is important to know what variant they have. It is even possible that you know, we still have a part, part of Delta existing among us, and those patients might still benefit from the treatment 
which we think may not work. And we cannot presume that is one completely taken over. Thank you for your explanations on the research you've done. And it's great to hear about what's happening at the labs at Rutgers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. The state today making what officials called an historic investment in preventing gun violence. Outside the Patterson Police Station, Governor Murphy and Acting Attorney General Andrew Brock announced they will invest $7 million in new equipment for law enforcement to help fight what the governor said is an epidemic of gun violence. State police data show a 45 percent increase in the number of people in the state who died in shootings in 2020 when compared with the prior year. The governor will also provide more than $8 million in grants to 25 community organizations for violence intervention programs. Funding for these investments is coming from federal American Rescue Plan funds. For law enforcement, this money will provide important tools like gunshot detection technology. This technology is already in use in multiple communities across the state, including here in Patterson. Not only has it proven accurate, but it has also proven its ability to direct police resources to the site of a shooting within mere moments. Not only will we, we be able to expand the footprint of this technology within these communities, but we'll be able to bring it into new communities where gun violence threatens the peace and security of our residents. Projects to protect coastal communities in Middlesex and Monmouth counties will be moving forward. Congressman Frank Pallone joined local leaders and business owners in Old Bridge today to detail plans to spend $200 million in federal infrastructure funds that are earmarked for Pallone's legislative district. Funds will be used to dredge the Raritan River, rebuild the Cheesequake Creek jetty, and replenish the beaches from Seabright to Manasquan. And there are also flood control projects planned for Highlands and a few other communities along the Raritan Bay Shore. This is the latest announcement regarding funds heading to New Jersey from the bipartisan infrastructure bill that President Biden signed into law last year. It's been months since Hurricane Ida hit our state, and residents displaced by the storm are still trying to get back on their feet. Many have found that FEMA aid only goes so far, and they've relied on community groups for additional help. Raven Santana talked with some storm victims who are grateful for the assistance. She was here stuck. And she was panicking a little, and that was, was the scary part was. Because she doesn't know how to swim, but I'm trying to tell her, you know, stay calm, you got this, get out the window, you know. Newark resident Antonio Gonzalez describing the moment his daughter was forced to escape through this window after his apartment began to overflow with Ida stormwaters. I was homeless in the car with my daughter for a few days. Gonzalez says he lived in a motel for a few months while he waited for the $9,000 FEMA had agreed to assist him with. I ended up paying like $8,200 in um, hotels. How much money were you left with and what were you able to buy here with it? Uh, I was left with about $800 and um, I bought two air mattresses, two heaters, and the clothing that me and my daughter has now. To be honest, FEMA didn't help my uncle at all, which he's the homeowner. I was um, in JOP, very thankful and grateful for them, and also NJAP helped me with the community center of Ironbound. Statewide FEMA has received nearly 85,000 applications for assistance in New Jersey related to Ida. For a total of $223.8 million, that includes 2,300 households in Newark that received FEMA assistance. But for some survivors, like Antonio and his daughter, the federal help is sometimes too little, too late. That's why community groups like the Ironbound Community Corporation make the Road and New Jersey Organizing Project are trying to bridge the gap through the NJ Ida Just Recovery Fund. Folks just experienced a horrific event in their life. Most people lost their car, their whole apartment, all of their personal belongings, um, you know, and it's like, are we going to ask for a receipt? Are we so just to make that bureaucratic process less cumbersome for our residents um, 
who are really in need. Some people had to move right away. Melanie Reyes is the housing justice manager for the Ironbound Community Corporation. Reyes says the statewide fund that started a few months ago has already raised half a million dollars. She says 85 to 90 percent of the applications live in Newark or the surrounding area and have had severe damage to their basements. We had individuals who applied for FEMA. We're still waiting for assistance. Uh, we prioritize those who were denied for funding or people who didn't qualify for those traditional aid sources or who were outside of traditional aid sources. If an individual had received funding, um, we would deduct the amount of funding received from what we were going to provide them. The range is between $3,000 and $10,000, and it all depends on the impact of each individual. We figured the easiest way to do this was through our organization's fiscal um, team, uh, just cutting checks out to the individual who applied. A FEMA spokesperson told NJ Spotlight News, FEMA's disaster assistance is focused on short-term recovery. Average grants are between $5,000 to $8,000 and aren't generally enough to make a person whole. FEMA is a piece of the puzzle, but not the entire puzzle. Gonzalez says he's still waiting for a fridge and more money to afford a stove and microwave. Reyes says the community groups are still accepting applications until next month when they expect to expend all the money they raised. FEMA says on average it takes fewer than 30 days to process an application and once an eligibility determination is made, applicants who request direct deposit may receive the funds in a matter of days. For those who prefer a check, that generally takes about 10 days. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. For some time, there's been talk in New Jersey about regionalizing school districts as one way to save money and drive efficiencies. Now, districts interested in exploring the idea can receive money thanks to a new bill signed by the governor last week, allowing districts to study whether mergers would make sense for them. At least one county is already considering a large-scale merger. Melissa Rose Cooper explores whether consolidation will improve education in New Jersey. As far as pulling resources, you can provide a lot more um, educational support to your students uh, than a single small district. Tony Suso is the superintendent of schools for the South Hunterdon Regional School District, which consolidated four separate districts into one in 2013 after school officials decided to merge. It's a change, Suso says, has been valuable to both students and staff. In the past, we are four separate districts with four separate curriculums. Eventually, students would make their way to the 712 building from three different districts. So, you know, each student could come to, you know, the 712 building with different experiences. So it was really beneficial to have one curriculum that all, every student would be exposed to. Now, hundreds of other school districts across New Jersey are getting the chance to see if consolidation could be a good move. This week, Governor Murphy signed legislation that would give incentives to districts interested in exploring a possible merger. There are very likely significant efficiencies that could be had. We have close to 600 school districts. It is not an efficient operation. Senator Declan O'Scanlan expressing his support for giving schools the opportunity to consolidate. He says not only does it increase learning opportunities, it also cuts down on costs. You can have a slightly larger uh, classrooms if you merge, you know, school districts, very small number of children uh, into more efficient classrooms. So there's potentially savings to be had there. Then there's educational opportunities. In smaller districts, frequently, they just can't afford to provide educational opportunities uh, that, that a larger district might be able to do. So the potential for both better education at lower taxpayer cost is, is a win-win. Under the law, school districts interested in consolidation will be given money so they can hire consultants who can explore how beneficial a merger would be. But it's a thought already on the minds of some districts like Salem County. Officials there used another state grant in 2020 to conduct a $143,000 study on whether to combine its 14 school districts. There's an estimate that there could be $6.8 million in savings in that unified approach to the school community as, as one county school district. 
there is a, an alternate proposal that is included in the plan or in the uh, study for a north and south being two school districts within the county. The savings, the amalgamated savings there would be less, it would be more in the $4 million range. The Salem County study also finding another possible benefit, more inclusivity in the classroom. If you look at our county, there are significant equity schisms that occur. And what the study does reveal is that the minority population in this county is growing with youth. Now, when you go to the census factors, we're about 80% white. But when you go to break that da data down to younger people, including school-age children, we move into about a 40% minority population. So there, there's a significant trend that's coming, but we're not necessarily structured to address equity uh, in, in our geography as we have right now. The state will pay for half of the study for school districts that choose to look into consolidation and the rest when the study is accepted. Once the study is complete, districts will have the right to decide if a merger is something they want. For NJ Spotlight News, I am Melissa Rose Cooper. Former New Jersey Senate President Steve Sweeney has lost another high-profile position. The leader of the state's Democratic Party, Leroy Jones, has removed Sweeney from the commission that is redrawing New Jersey's legislative districts. Jones said he made the decision after careful consideration. Sweeney is being replaced by Laura Matos, who heads the Pinelands Commission. Sweeney is not going away quietly. He's filed a lawsuit challenging the move, saying Jones did not have the authority to remove him. In tonight's Spotlight on Business, investment returns for New Jersey's public worker pension fund have deflated a bit. According to the state's latest preliminary estimates, the fund's returns came in below 4 percent in the first half of the current fiscal year. In the prior fiscal year, returns were up nearly 30 percent. Budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer joins me to explain what's behind the drop. John, good to see you again. Same here, Rhonda. Thanks for having me again. John, the pension fund had been beating the assumed rate of return until now. So what happened? What happened is the, the great run that the financial markets were in, you know, going back to last year, you know, it's come back down to earth a little bit. And so the investment returns are still in the black, which is good news for the pension fund. But, you know, totals were hitting close to 30 percent around last summer when the fiscal year came to an end. And, and that really was the highest amount seen in a long, long time for the pension fund. Now, through the first six months of the new fiscal year, which just ended in December, the, that, that first six month window, uh, it's closer to 4 percent, which is not bad, a little under what the pension fund assumes will be generated each year, but still in the black for sure. How is the fund doing when we look at the last few years and kind of average out some of this fluctuation that we're seeing? You know, the, for the, the annualized returns for the last five, you know, five years, even going back two decades, are still uh, going above the assumed rate, which is a little higher than 7% right now. And so that's something that you want to see. I mean, you, these are long-term investments, and so it's, it's not like day trading here. But you do want to see them generating, you know, pretty healthy annual uh, investment returns because every dollar that is earned from investments is perhaps a dollar that doesn't have to be contributed by employees or, or, or taxpayers because taxpayers help fund public worker pensions in New Jersey on the employer side. And so it's always good to see the investments returning uh, healthy gains um, on a year over year basis. Also helpful for the fund was the fact that there was a full contribution made by the Murphy administration. Are there expectations that that will continue? Murphy has talked a lot about maintaining robust pension funding and that issue came up during a meeting of the State Investment Council yesterday where members were given the impression to expect more significant funding for the pension system, which was uh, music to their ears yesterday. But we still have a long way to go until the fund is really able to manage all the liabilities, right? I mean, I guess we're going on the right track, but there's a, a hole to dig out of. That's absolutely right. So all those years of the state not making its full pension payment, and in some years making no pension payment at all, has dug a deep, deep hole. 
And the state's starting to dig out of that hole, but it will require decades of significant pension contributions. The current budget spends seven billion dollars on the pension uh, contribution, which is you know more than ten percent of total spending. And so it will take a significant commitment over decades to get out of this hole. Don, thank you. Good to see you. You're welcome. Now let's take a look at how the stock market traded today. And make sure you tune in to NJ Business Beat with me this weekend. We're taking you into the metaverse and putting its financial future in focus, highlighting the benefits to businesses who enter the virtual world. Check it out on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel Saturdays at 10 a.m. That does it for us tonight, but tune in to Reporters Roundtable with senior political correspondent David Cruz. This week, David talks to new Senate Education Committee Chair Senator Vingo Powell about the top legislative priorities for New Jersey schools and students in the pandemic, plus all the week's big political headlines with a panel of reporters. That's tomorrow morning at 10 on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. I'm Rhonda Schapther. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSEG Foundation. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.